17 U.S.C. 107 federal law allows citizens to use copyrighted media for fair use. That is criticism, news reporting, teaching, and parody. Uma, Yahoo, we are put to you there, we are new to me for that. Arrive of you, oh Yahoo, Uma, let your enemies be scattered, and let those that hate thee flee from before thee. Let all of Yashara, Yisrael, who love, worship, and praise Yahweh, give him thanks by saying hallelujah. Shalom everyone and welcome to Into All Truth. My name is Rachel. We welcome donations and we thank you everyone for donations that you made for calendars and cookbooks. Make a donation of $35 or more at livelightwell.com and you'll go get both the calendar and the Hebraic Lifestyle Chaya Eat Life and Fast book. And I pray that as you listen to this study that the Ruach HaKodesh will lead you into all truth and show you things to come. Barukata Kulam in the name of Yahusha Hamashiach. Stolen identity A lock without a key We've been the butt of the joke throughout History No thy cells twelve tribes Yas that I cry True we release relies Stolen identity A lock without a key Welcome family. Today we are dealing with the African Empire which scattered Israel and that would be the Edomians, the Arabs, and Esau, Edom. And so we're going to get into this and that includes among the Ethiopians because he is in Ethiopia. And so let's get into the four carpenters and in particular the first carpenter we'll call him and that is the Africans. The reason why I wanted to do this video is because I've explored these scriptures on four carpenters repatriating Israel to their land. So the four carpenters are described as four artificers, okay? Four artificers. And so it's going to be by prophecy and scripture that we determine who these people are. The four carpenters, Zechariah 2. And I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, four horns. And I said to the angel that spoke with me, What are these, my Lord? And he said to me, These are the horns that have scattered Judah and Israel and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed me four artificers. And I said, What are these coming to do? And he said, These are the horns that scattered Judah, and they broke Israel into pieces and none of them lifted up his head. And these are come forth to sharpen them for their hands, even the four horns, the nations that lifted up the horn against the land of Yahuwah to scatter it. And I lifted up my eyes and I looked and behold a man in his hand with a measuring line. And I said to him, whether goest thou? And he said to me to measure Jerusalem to see what is the breadth of it and what is the length of it. And behold, the angel that spoke with me stood by, and another angel went forth to meet him and spoke to him, saying, Run and speak to that man, saying, Jerusalem shall be fully inhabited by the reason of the abundance of men and cattle in the midst of her. And I will be to her, saith Yahuwah, a wall of fire round about, and I will be for a glory in the midst of her. 
Hallelujah. So you guys, that is the promise of the end of the scattering, the final regathering. But we should take a look at this because these are the true, the translations, two different translations. And I lifted up my eyes and looked and behold four horns. And I said to the angel that spoke with me, what are these things, my Lord? And he said to me, these are the horns that have scattered Judah and Israel in Jerusalem. And, the El and Elohim showed me four artificers. And I said, what are these coming to do? And he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah and they broke Israel in pieces and none of them lifted up his head. And these are come forth to sharpen them for their hands, even the four horns, the nations that lifted up the horn against the land of Yahuwah to scatter it. Okay, so that is the Septuagint version. And down here is the KJV version. Then I said, what come these to do? And he spake, saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man did lift up his head, but these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which have lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. So this is King James, and it's a Masoretic text translated by the Ashkenazis. So it's very clear here when we read that it says these are the horns that scattered Judah and they broke Israel into pieces and none of them lifted up their head or had any sympathy. And these are come forth to sharpen them for their hands, even the four horns, the nations that lifted up the horn against the land of Yahuwah to scatter it. So the same people who scattered and lifted up their horns against Israel are the same ones coming to try to sharpen Israel for their purpose. Now it says in this one, they've come to cast out the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. But in this one, it's saying that these are the very same ones who scattered it. And I think the Septuagint is right, and we're going to see that that's true. Now I want to focus on the term artificer. An artificer is a skilled worker, a craftsperson, one that contrives, devises, or constructs something, a deceptive or devious person. So we often hear that these are the four carpenters. Proper word is artificers, artificers. And so this is who they are. Africa, Iran, Russia, and China. All right. And so Iran is like the real Medo-Persians or part of that land was also Assyria. That's a whole section we've gone into in the other videos on the land of Ham and everything. And so we're going to get into the blurry lines around who the Medo-Persians really were because they're a combination of Japheth and Shem and the Assyrians were right next door. Uh, there's also Africa. Now this is Egypt, Islam, the Sudan, Ethiopia, the Danites, the Midianites. Remember I told you in the other videos on Prester John that when Joseph went into captivity, the Midianites took him up. They sold him to the, the Ishmaelites who sold him to the Egyptians. And then the Edomites kept them captive. And then the Midianites helped them with their release and so on and so forth. So this, these are the descendants of Abraham, all right, who war with Israel. Just like these are the descendants of Shem you know, mixed in with Japheth a little bit, who war with Israel. And these nations are also mixed with other nations. Okay, and so there's China, who I'm going to call the Khans and the Huns and Canaan, because the Huns, the Hun, are obviously Mongoloid. They're a mix of Canaan and Japheth. And then obviously Canaan is a descendant of Ham. And then we have Russia, who are the Khazars, Tartaria, Gog, and Magog. Okay? And so these are the nations that both, we're going to find both scattered Israel and these are also the nations that are coming to what, what does it say? That come forth to sharpen them for their hands. So if you'll notice or remember in my videos on the Muslims, I keep reiterating over and over again that they are going to try to usurp the identity of Israel and move with Israel 
through the regathering. But of course, Yah is going to ultimately have this his way. And they're trying to get ahead of, ahead of it all. Okay? And that's the strategy because this is why that you can't say that there are no black Edomites. And we're going to show I'm going to show you very clearly that there are. This is the way that Hasitan is strategizing by holding on to his black players to try and usurp the kingdom again. All right. And so I've talked about that in my um, The Return of the Scepter video. So you can go and check that out. All right. So let's get into these four artificers. Okay. And notice how artificer can mean an artist or a builder or master builder. I just did a Google search for images on artificers and builders. And this is the image that came up. And this is obviously a Masonic type building. I couldn't even find out what it was. It was just a random photo and you see it's got a tree with six branches and then it's got the pineal pine cone at the top. And so this is clearly Masonic imagery in a Masonic temple. And these are the master builders. These are the architects, the artificers. So these aren't just carpenters. These are those who maketh a lie. Okay. But this is the technical definition. Definition: Master builder or master mason is a central figure leading construction projects in pre-modern times and precursor to the modern architect and engineer. So the engineers we know are associated with masons and architecture is also associated with masons. Okay, so these are the four carpenters or artificers. Okay. All right, so here's one of the key scriptures that helps us to identify some of these four carpenters. All right, so this is in the, the book of Ezra's 1520. Ezra, descendant of Zadok, and Aaron of the tribe of Levi, captive to the Medo-Persia and Arctic Xerxes. Behold, saith Yahuwah, I will call together all the kings of the earth to reverence me, which are from the rising of the sun, from the south, from the east, and Labanus, to turn themselves one against another and repay the things that they have done to them. The fire is gone forth from his wrath and has consumed the foundations of the earth and the sinners like straw that is kindled. Behold, an horrible vision, and the appearance thereof from the east, where the nations of the dragons of Arabia shall come out with many chariots, and the multitude of them shall be carried as the wind upon the earth, that they which hear them shall fear and tremble. Also the Carmanians raging in wrath shall go forth as the wild boars of the wood." And from the land of the Assyrians shall the enemy besiege them and consume some of them. And in their host shall be fear and dread and strife among their kings. Behold, clouds from the east and from the north and unto the south. And they are very horrible to look upon, full of wrath and storm. And they shall go steadfastly unto Babylon and make her afraid. And they shall come unto her and besiege her, and the star and all the wrath shall they pour out upon her. And then shall the dust and smoke go up to the heaven, and they that shall be about her shall bewail her. Okay, so there's a couple of groups we have to look at here, and that is we're talking about people who are from the rising of the sun, from the south, and from the east and from Labanus, okay? So, um, Libyan or Le Lebanon, because we still don't really have the right geography. And the nations of the dragons of Arabia. So we know the Arabians are part of this. People from the so-called East, they always call China the East, but it's not, but there you go. And the Carmanians, who are the Carmanians? And from the land of the Assyrians. And so let's take a look. In the book of Daniel, there is a discussion of the four kingdoms that arise to oppose themselves to Israel and take her into captivity. There are four beasts. The first is a lion, which represents 
the Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, the golden kingdom with wings. That's because it has the Babylonian eagle attached to it or the phoenix. It is fundamentally Babylonian or Egyptian. The second, as we already went through, is the bear with three ribs, representing the Assyrian captivity, the Babylonian captivity, and the Medo-Persian captivity. And after these things shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. And now this refers to the thighs of bronze on the statue of of Nebuchadnezzar, which represents the four Egyptian or satanic kingdoms. So next is the Greco-Roman Empire. Now Alexander the Great takes the ten tribes captive to Greece. And this is why he is the leopard with the eagle wings, because he was a descendant of Esau Edom. And so what does Daniel say about this kingdom? After this one I looked, and behold, another wild beast as a leopard, and it had four wings of a bird upon it, and the wild beast had four heads, and the power was given to it. So this is the beast of the four corners of the earth ruling the seas. Now, as, again, as I said, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson was ruling the Babylonian Empire, and in Tema, Tamen, which is the land of Esau. Now Esau also took over the Ethiopian identity and they are also symboled by the leopard who can't change their spots because they are a spotted mixed nation due to the fact they are ruled by Esau Edom. The kings of the south, the dragons of Arabia. So let's get into the black Arabs now. And this would be the first carpenter after the fall of the temple. And so this is the land, and of course you know that I believe that this is the head of the earth, and so this is Abyssinia. Now we're always going around about Moors and what does Moor mean, but just here's a reference from Nation Knows No Color Line, and of course Zondervan Dictionary talks about how the Hamites were the Ethiopians, Libyans, and Canaanites, and Egyptians. But, of course, we know they mixed in with Israel and they settled at the front of the, the Nile. All right. And that was because they were scattered also and their land was broken up and destroyed due to judgment. And so how did they look? Because everyone thinks that, you know, over there in that land, that the Arabs are white people with white skin. Here's just some highlights here. Niger. Niger means black. Niger Black. It's the surname of Simeon, one of the five prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch, who were led of Yahuwah to send forth Paul and Barnabas. Probably a Hebrew Christian from North Africa. So it is associated with black skin. All right. And then it says of the, the black Moors and the Arabs, so predominant was black skin of the Moorish invaders of Europe that the Black Amor, black as Moor, came to be used not only for the Mor as for the Moroccans, but for other blacks as Ethiopian and Sudanese. As Elliot Smith says, the Negro admixture is so evident among the Moroccans. So when you're talking about Black Amors, all right, Negroes, they are black people. So the real Arabs are black. The original Arabs are black. All right. Um, Hambly, a more recent writer, says in physique, a Moor may be a Berber or an Arab or a mixture of the two with Negro blood as well. All right. So talking about the Negroes, says many American Negroes are indistinguishable from Arabs. That's the report of the meeting between President Roosevelt and King Ibn Saud. Okay. And King Ibn Saud is actually a descendant of the Rothschilds. Right, so let's get into the Arab slave trade because we know that Joseph was sold to the Egyptians and the Arab slave trade has been a very powerful slave trade. All right. It continues to this day. All right. And so these are the white Arabs who took over from the black Arabs in enslaving the whole world. But first it started, of course, with the original Arabs who were black Arabs. You know, as we're learning more and more now, there was a conflation, in other words, a confusion and mixing of the identity of the Moors and the Jews because it became taboo to call yourself a Hebrew or Yahudin because you would be persecuted or killed. So they started calling themselves Moors and Edom was calling themselves Moors. But it's actually the Moors who enslaved, when they talk about slavery, 
in West Africa or even coming out of Europe. If you're talking about slavery, you're talking about the Edomites, the Arab Edomites, and the Arab Africans, the most Arab Muslims enslaving the Is Israelites and even force converting them to become Muslims and then sharing and taking on their identity. Again, this is the Umayyad dynasty and they were a Bantu dynasty who were West Africans. So they were Shemites and they helped the Arabs to conquer Western Europe because the 10 tribes had lost the North African and, and Western European territories that belonged to Shem. And there is no northern border for the land of Abraham. It goes all the way from the Ethiopic Sea, which is the Egyptian Sea, according to Jubilees, and then all the way to Euphrates. There's no northern border and there's no southern border. In fact, it goes all the way to the tongue of the sea. So that means it goes all the way to the Rubus Negro. So that was their territory. And they lost it when they had their scattering. And so Judah and the remaining tribes that were scattered had to fight to get it back because when the temple fell and even Rome was broken down by the Goths and everything, they began to take those lands over because Israel was scattered, okay? Scattered into the West and scattered deep into Africa. We've already gone over this, but go ahead and read through some of it if you want. All right, so we're going to talk about this guy, Ayub, but what we wanna say is that the Turkic people, the Russian horde, or the Ottomans were descended from the Taimans, from Taman, who was one of the sons of Esau, okay? And they are so associated with Job, Iob, son of Esau, in the land of Esau. So Job went through his trial in Uz or Oz, all right? And his name was Iob or Job, all right? And these are associated later with the Oz Oghuz Kangan with the Mongolians, okay? So we went over this history in Prester John, but I just want you to see the Ottoman Sultan's primacy among the Turkish monarchs, all right? So they were above them because these were the real Edomites. These are the Edomites who typically ran down and captured Israel in West Africa. So Job was also an Edomite. Job was the one who had the trial of his life, lost his entire family, and then Yah gave his family back to him. So this is actually, if you're Isarian or an Edomite, this is the trial of your life. You have to leave your entire family to join Israel and your family will be given back to you. Okay, so this is not to discriminate against those who have a heart for Yah, which was the real promise that Yah had also given to Esau as a possibility for his life. Here is the areas where the Nigerians are and where Edom is. And this is a particular Edomite, Ayo, Ayuba or Suleiman, Solomon Diallo, or Job Solomon Diallo. And of course, Job, some speculate that he was actually an Edomite. This gentleman was a Muslim and he captured and enslaved the Hebrews coming out of these areas in uh, Nigeria. And you can also see here's another map of Edom. And this again is in the same region where we saw the map of Africa and the Hebrews. Because they would sell to the Europeans, the Europeans could not handle the mosquitoes, they could not handle um, the malaria or the heat. So this is the work that the black Edomites did in Africa. And this particular guy was an Arab Edomite slave stealer trader who was captured by the Yahudin after capturing a whole bunch of Hebrews and selling them into slavery. And then he was sold to the very trader he had just sold all the Hebrews to. And then he was taken to America. He begged him beforehand, the, the white slave trader. And so he pleaded with the guy and he said, look, I just sold you a bunch of slaves, but his beard had been shaved off and his hair had been shaved off as well. So 
They said he said, "Well, contact your people, send for them, and if they come get you, I'll free you." But he was sent to an Amer to America, and then when he arrived there soon after, he was freed and sent back to and celebrated and sent back. Arab slave trade it was a combination of both enslaving Israel, and then when the Gentiles took over and they took on the identity even of the Arabs, like the Ottomans through the line of Esau. They also enslaved. So white people were enslaved, black people were enslaved, but of course, more black people were enslaved than anybody else because they're Israel. And so they're the most persecuted people in the world due to the punishment from Yah. Okay? So this is from HowAfrica.com, 10 facts about the Arab enslavement of black people not taught in schools. Okay? So this is not going to be pleasant, guys. So br please brace yourselves. The number of people enslaved by the Muslims has been hotly debated. Now, of course, because they want to deny the persecution of Israel. Some historians estimate between AD 650 and 1900, 10 million to 20 million people were enslaved by Arab slave traders. Others believe it was 20 million. And so um, the legacy of Arab Islam in Africa estimates that over 80 million more black people died over that route. The Arab slave trade typically dealt in the sale of castrated male slaves and black boys between the age of 8 and 12. So Israelite boys between 8 and 12 were, had their uh, members completely amputated. Six of every 10 bled to death during the procedure, according to some sources. But the high price brought by eunuchs on the market made the practice profitable. Some men were castrated to be eunuchs in domestic service. And this practice was not only limited to black males. The Khalifa in Baghdad at the beginning of the 10th century had 7,000 black eunuchs and 4,000 white eunuchs in his palace, says Ronald Siegel in his 2002 book, Islam's Black Sa Slaves, the Other Black Diaspora. Now they say Arab is not a racial classification. Well, it has, they have mixed but originally the first Arabs, as we know, were blacks because they would be Ishmaelites and they would have been descendants of Abraham who dwelt in a hot land, a land that was both hot and cold. All of Africa is very hot. And of course, the Egyptians who dwelt in a hot land as well. The land of Ham is hot. And so they were dark skinned. They were known as Ham was related to people of burnt or dark faces, and they were compared to Ethiopian who Ethiopians who cannot change the color of their skin. So they were black, mixed with black. In the beginning, there was more of a mutual respect between blacks and the more lighter skinned Arabs. However, as Islam demanded for enslaved blacks grew, so did racism towards African. As a casual association with black skin and slave began to be established, racist attitudes towards blacks began to manifest in Arab language and literature. The word for slave, abid, became a colloquialism for African. And here's an image of the women being traded as slaves, the African women. Now this is the Israelites. The Eastern Arab slave trade dealt primarily with African women maintaining a ratio of two women to each man. These women and young girls were used by Arabs and other Asians as concubines and menials. A Muslim slaveholder was entitled by law to the sexual enjoyment of his slave women, filling the harems of wealthy Arabs. African women bore them a host of children. The Arab slave trade in the 19th century was economically tied to the European new opportunities of exploitation were provided by the transatlantic slave trade. This sent Arab slavers into overdrive. The Portuguese on the Swahili coast profited directly and were responsible for the boom in the Arab trade. Meanwhile, on the West African coast, the Portuguese found Muslim merchants entrenched along the African coast as far as the Bight of Benin, and these European enslavers found they could make considerable amounts of gold transporting enslaved Africans from one trading post to another along the Atlantic coast. And the Arab slave trade continues today. You're not to despise your brother Esau, and so here's some history to gain some understanding about the superiority of the Arab culture once they rose up. And they actually allied with Israel 
in the West, in Western Europe and Spain and everything. So let's let Ivan, Ivan Van Sertema tell us a bit about it and what they built. Troops and Arab types, which are both black, as well as a few of them being fair-skinned types. We do know that in the Umayyad dynasty, something very unusual begins to happen. First of all, the Muslims show themselves to be extremely generous in victory. Instead of trying to destroy everything they find in Europe and plant their own stuff in, they allow the Europeans to live side by side with them. As they say, they retreated Muslim, Jew, and Christian alike. The Jews, in fact, assist the Muslims to defeat the Christians because the Christians are persecuting the Jews. So this is another factor that we find um, in the world of the Umayyad. Another thing unusual that begins to happen is that wherever races are strange to each other or are polarized, you find magnetic attractions between races. Wherever you have polarization, you have this occurring. And you find, for example, that the Jews who had already been made slaves, now their slavery is up. Important thing to note here is that something began to happen which is very unfortunate, and that is the white slave trade. Slave comes from Slav. And the reason why the word slave comes from Slav is that the first slaves are white. The Arabs and the Jews get involved in this. It is said that Abdul Rahman had nothing to do with it. He did not give it its blessing, etc. But they seem to be have some sort of secret on the ground slave trade going on. And you find just as when the whites took over countries, they brought black women into their harems, or at least had secret liaisons with black women, you have white women finding themselves into the concubinages or harems of Arabs and Africans. Because when the Muslims cracked up in Europe, the Africans were thrust again into Europe and sustained the Muslim dynasties. Thus it is that just around the time the Caliph is dethroned, we find something happening, beginning to happen in Africa. A man called Yahya, an African called Yahya, is um, developing a movement in the Sahara. He links an African called Yahya is um, developing a movement in the Sahara. He links an African called Yahya is um, developing a movement in the Sahara. He links sovereign, a sultan who takes full control from about 1086 AD, and this runs for a whole century. This century, very remarkable things happen. The Africans have their court in Africa and their court in Spain, just as the Europeans later were to have their their um, empire consolidated at home and abroad. The Africans have their courts in Africa and their courts in Spain. And the Almoravids, they um, are very strong until Yusuf dies and then comes his son who is not as strong. A man arises, a leader in Africa in the tw early 12th century who calls himself Mahdi or the Mahdi and his followers uh, begin to strengthen themselves and they push aside the Almoravids and they invade Europe and by 1150 their armies defeat the Christians of Spain. This is the last of the great African dynasties. It runs right through to 1230 AD when eventually the Christians con begin to push the Africans back. About three million Africans go back down into Africa and the things begin to break up in the Iberian Peninsula and by this still holds, it still holds a certain strength for about 200 years until 1492, the very year Columbus sailed, the last great battle between the Christians and the Moors occurred, and the Christians are finally defeated at Granada, and a massive destruction of Moorish documents occurred. But what did the Moors bring to Europe? Europe was in the dark age. Whatever the Greeks may have done, whatever the Romans may have done, Europe had fallen into grave decline. European science was a joke compared to African and Asian science. The Europeans, for example, one of them um, was trying to show that the distance from the Earth to the Moon was the diameter of the Earth. In order to write the diameter of the Earth, 
he calculated or estimated the circumference and divided it by two. That was the level of science. There was no complex mathematics, no complex um, science in, in either in Spain or any part of Europe at that time. Many things that, many advances that had been made by the Greeks and Romans were lost. So that when Chandler calls his article, Light of Europe's Dark Age, this is a very true and precise statement of what was happening. Then comes the Moors. And the Moors caused a massive movement of knowledge into the places where they settled. Thus we find that Spain becomes the main center for the translation of all the works of antiquity. Egyptian works and all other works that are translated into Arabic, then they're translated into Spanish, then they're translated into Latin. Thus Europe becomes open, and the Muslims become open to the knowledge of the world. They thrust into India, they bring back various things. How many, how many of us know that the Europeans only counted with letters? The Europeans did not have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If you talk about Roman numerals, it's IX and X, and those are letters. The Greeks use letters to count with. The Romans use letters. It is the Indian, the Hindu, who had those numerals, and the Arabs brought it out of India. Many things were brought out of Egypt. Many things were brought out of various parts of the world in order to build what was later to be known as Western civilization, so that we have an extraordinary situation. One of the things that is most remarkable is that the very things that were used to defeat us came from outside of Europe. Artillery, firearms are not European in origin. People like to say, oh, we defeated you because we had superior firepower. Where did they get it from? The Arabs, a manuscript in Leningrad, an Arabic manuscript shows the first use of artillery by the Moors in a battle with the Indians. The chemical components of gunpowder are developed through the chemistry of the Moors. The Europeans do not know about gunpowder. Gunpowder had been used even earlier by the Egyptians, but it was not used in the way it was used by the Europeans later on. But the Arabs used it in that way. They did use it in artillery. And the first firing of artillery in the world is by the Moors. And the first use of gunpowder in that context. And the ships, the ships were so absolutely critical to the expansion of the European Empire. Look at those ships. Take the caravel, for example, the Portuguese caravel. Many of the nautical instruments, the compass, the astrolabe, are not invented in Europe. They are brought in by the Moors from other parts of the world. So that Spain, where the Moors concentrated, became a center through which all of these things coalesced. That is the reason why. Spain was able to make the first major thrust on Portugal, not because of any other special advantage, because when we compare what was happening in the rest of Europe, we are a poor. Let me force in Europe. In Cordova, the old pack Cordova, they found a city of 250,000 houses and 1 million people when no city in Europe outside Moorish Spain had a population of 30,000. Its massive walls had a circuit of 14 miles and had seven large iron gates faced with brass. Its streets were paved so soundly indeed that in some of them you tread the same stones today. Just as you cross the Guadalquivir on the same noble bridge drained by large sewers, flushed with water from the many fountains which sparkled in the sun and lit by lamps at night. It had 80,455 shops besides 4,300 markets, and in these you could buy amber from the Baltic, Russian furs, Chinese tea, Indian spices, African ebony and ivory, and more than 1,000 mosques, the largest of which is still one of the ar ar architectural wonders of the world in spite of later Spanish disfigurement. Its low scarlet and gold roof supported by 1,000 columns of marble, jasper, and porphyry was lit by thousands of brass and silver lamps which burned perfumed oil, the largest being 38 feet in circumference 
containing 46,000 silver plates for reflecting the light. The exquisite prayer chamber, the unique pulpit, and the Cali's private section with floors of silver and gold-plated doors completed this wonderful monument of opulence and art. When we look at the arts and sciences, and that is something that is most remarkable, paper was introduced by the Moors into Spain. The windmill was introduced into Europe by the Moors. Gunpowder was introduced into Europe by the Moors. Artillery was introduced into Europe by the Moors. The nautical instruments like the astrolab and the compass, the, the three-cornered or four-cornered axial rudder, the three-masted ships, all these were introduced by the Moors. Here we have claiming about all of this tremendous industrial revolution that came purely out of European genius. While in the 10th and 11th centuries, all Europe could show scarcely a single public library, note this, and could boast of only two universities that were worthy of the name, there were in Spain at that same time under the Moors more than 70 public libraries, of which the one in Cordova alone contained 600,000 manuscripts. In addition, the country possessed 17 famous universities, among which those at Cordova, Seville, Granada, Malaga, Jaén, Valencia, Almeria, and Toledo were especially outstanding. Astronomy, physics, chemistry, mathematics, geometry, philology, geography reached in Spain the highest stage at the time known anywhere. Artists and scholars united in special associations for the pursuit of their studies. There were regular congresses of all branches of science where the latest achievements of research were announced and discussed which naturally contributed greatly to the spread of scientific thought. Another most amazing thing was that the Moors were the first to introduce air conditioning. They heated the houses in the winter, and they did an unusual thing, which we do not even do now. When they brought cool air into the house, it wasn't just cool, it was perfume. They ran it over banks of flowers, noted for their perfume. Art, literature, and science prospered as they then prospered nowhere else in Europe. Students flocked from France and Germany and England to drink from the fountain of learning which flowed only in the cities of the Moors. The surgeons and doctors were in the ban of science. Women were encouraged to devote themselves to serious study, and the lady doctor was not unknown among the people of Cordova. Mathematics, astronomy, and botany, history, philosophy, and jurisprudence were to be mastered in Spain and Spain alone. The practical work of the field, the scientific methods of irrigation, the arts of fortification and shipbuilding, the highest and most elaborate products of the loom, the graver and the hammer, the potter's wheel and the mason's trowel were brought to perfection by the Spanish Moors. And when we come to the end, and this is something that I really have to read, when we come to the very end, because it's said in words that one cannot equal in speech the death that occurs in Spain, the death of greatness after the Moors are banished. In 1492, the last bulwark of the Moors gave way before the crusade of Ferdinand and Isabella, and with Granada fell all of Spain's greatness. For a brief while, indeed, the reflection of the Moorish splendor cast a borrowed light on the history of the land which is at once warmed with its sunny radiance. The great epoch of Isabella, Charles V and Philip II, of Columbus, Cortez, and Pizarro shed a last hollow about the dying monument, the dying moments of a mighty state. Then followed the abomination of desolation, the rule of the stupid inquisition, and the blackness of darkness in which Spain has been plunged ever since. In the land where science was once supreme, the Spanish doctors became noted for nothing but their ignorance and incapacity. And the discoveries of Newton and Harvey were condemned as pernicious to the faith. Where once 70 public libraries had fed the minds of scholars and half a million books had been gathered at Cordova for the benefit of the world. Such indifference to learning afterwards prevailed that the new capital, Madrid, possessed not a single public library in the 18th century. Note that. The Moors left. They were kicked out at the end of the 15th century, having left 70 libraries. And when the Africans and Arabs were forced to return back into Africa by the 18th century, they didn't have one public library. The 16,000 looms of Seville soon dwindled to a fifth of their ancient number. The arts and industries of Toledo and Almeria faded into insignificance. The very baths 
public buildings of equal ornament and use were destroyed because cleanliness savored too strongly of rank infidelity. Note that. Do you know it was a sin to smile, to show any kind of sensuality, laughter, in the, in, during the Inquisition in, in some of the courts? The land deprived of the skillful irrigation of the moors grew impoverished and neglected. The richest and most fertile valleys languished and were deserted. Most of the populous cities which had filled every district of Andalusia fell into ruinous decay, and beggars, friars, and bandits took the place of scholars, merchants, and knights. So low fell Spain when she had driven away the blacks. Such is the melancholy contrast offered by her history. And this is by Stanley Lane Poole, by the way. There is a large history of the collapse of these Muslim empires in Africa and how Queen Elizabeth was and the British Empire was part a huge part of toppling them. But let's go into what happened in recent history in Nigeria. The time of the conquest of Northern Africa by the Arabs between 639 and 708 AD, some merchants penetrated into the western part of the land of the blacks and found among them no king more powerful than the king of Ghana. His states extended westward to the shores of the Atlantic Ocean, Kumbe Sela, and the capital of this strong populous nation was made up of two towns and formed one of the greatest and best populated cities in the world. Okay, so this is according to Ibn Khaldun, the philosophy of history. So these were the actual Hebrew Israelites kingdoms in that area that were then taken over by the Arabs. The role of the Mandingas in their capital city, Nani, Sandiata Kita. He conquered ancient Ghana in 1240, and Masa Musa built the Malayan Empire 1312 to 1337. Islam was the religion of the cities and Eric became the scholar, the language of scholarship and trade was based on gold, salt, and copper. Buktu was founded during the dominance of the Ghanaian Empire, the Ghana Empire, and Songhai Desert Nomads founded it around 1100 AD. Typically they camped near a river in dry season and took their animals to graze inland and then they would trust their belongings to their slaves. And the campsite was called Tim and the Well of Buktu. What began as a semi-permanent nomadic settlement evolved into a town and then a city of permanent settlement. From 1100 to 1300, the city developed into a thriving commercial center. That what was life like in Timbuktu? According to Tariq al fatash Timbuktu has no equal among the cities of the blacks and was known for its solid institutions, political libraries, purity of morals, security of its people and their goods, compassion towards the poor and strangers, as well as courtesy and generosity towards students and scholars. There were many products that they traded in, textiles, tea, tobacco. However, the most profitable trade item in Timbuktu was books. Tariq al fatish says that the king bought a great dictionary for the equivalent price of two horses. The great Sankor University built around 1300 was funded by a woman of the Agal Aglal, a religious Tuareg ethnicity. The Sankor quarter of northeast Timbuktu became the dwelling place of the scholars and teachers and it was here that the first libraries were created. Scholars and kings acquired their books during their travels from merchants coming from the north and with books for sale. Mansa Musa bought the works on Maliki law and ordered the construction of the great mosque of Timbuktu. Now it was a religious city and there was an pro African proverb that said salt comes from the north, gold to the south, and silver from the country of the white man. The word of God and the treasures of wisdom were only to be found in Timbuktu. Pious Sikh Abdu Abdullah had no property and bought slaves that he might give them their liberty. Also, some of the holiest and learned men resided in Walata. Learning flourished within Jan. It had a university of very high reputation. The university boasted of having 
thousands of teachers their reports of several different surgical operations successfully performed by the medical doctors of Jen in, for example, cataract eye surgery, and to book to surpass them both after 1500. According to the Destruction of Black Civilization by Chancellor Williams, in the Muslim destruction of the Songhai Empire, or the Shungite Empire, the main centers of learning with all their precious libraries and original manuscripts were destroyed first. According to Diop, the loss of the judicial and administrative archives assistance of Cadiz kept the minutes of the sessions, but tons of documents have disappeared. Influenced by Williams and Diop, most black scholars believe that West Africa's intellectual heritage was destroyed mostly after 1591, so that's around the Inquisition. Ahmed Baba complained to the Sultan of Morocco that his troops had stolen 1,600 books from him, and this was the smallest library of any of his friends, 1,600 books. He wrote 70 works in Arab Arabic, many on jurisprudence, but some on grammar and syntax. Professor Chancellor Williams says Baba was the greatest and most prolific African writer and scholar in the 16th century. Perhaps African can be dropped here. For who else, Asian or European, authored a comprehensive dictionary and 40, actually 70 other works during this period? Eventually, all great things come to an end. There were problems in Morocco and Sultan Muhammad was dethroned. Sin a sinister alliance between the Sultan al-Mansur of Morocco and Queen Elizabeth I of England. The role of English armed trading in Morocco is what turned everything around and the British ruled. Upon gaining independence from Great Britain in 1916, the newly formed Nigerian Republic was greatly divided as its three largest ethnic groups struggled to live in harmony. Beyond the more obvious distinctions like language, clothing, and marriage customs, Nigeria's three main ethnic groups also had fundamental differences in values and worldviews, which had been developed over the many centuries leading up to the colonial era and the formation of the Nigerian state. The Igbos, who represented about 60 to 70 percent of the population of the Southeast, were mostly Christians who, in the centuries before the colonial era, had lived in relatively egalitarian societies. Igbos' particular appreciation for wealth creation through hard work is undoubtedly the main reason why many of Nigeria's champions of industry have been of Igbo ancestry. By contrast, the majority Muslim Hausa Fulani, which represented about 65 percent of the northern population, had lived for many years in feudal societies in which large working class populations were ruled by a small theocratic elite composed of emirs and sultans. As their political leaders often doubled as religious leaders, compliance and submission to the will of the political establishment was not simply a civic duty, but a religious one. Very much unlike in Igbo societies, there was nothing particularly odd or shameful about a man aspiring to live a modest life as a farm worker, craftsman, or a nomadic cattle herder. Some studies estimated that as of Nigeria's independence in 1960, Northern Nigeria had an English literacy rate of just 2%, compared to the Southeast, which had an English literacy rate of 19.2%. The Yorubas, which formed about 75% of Nigeria's southwestern population, were in many ways a sort of halfway house between the Igbos and the Hausa Fulani, both in terms of their religious affiliation and their political history. Although also majority Christian, they nevertheless had significant populations of Muslims as well as followers of the ancient Yoruba religions. In simple terms, the traditional Yoruba political structure was basically less autocratic than the Hausa Fulani, but not as democratic as the Igbo. For centuries, Yoruba societies were ruled by kings known as Obas, who governed in close consultation with chiefs, priests, and priestesses. Culturally, the Yorubas were quite similar to the Igbo in their appreciation for individual drive and ambition. However, the Yorubas tended to channel their energies towards excellence in the arts and academia, as opposed to pure industry and wealth creation. It would be very far from the truth. In reality, most Yoruba societies got on well enough with Igbo societies. The main culture clash, if you like, was between the Hausa Fulanis of the North and the two major ethnic groups of the South. Prior to the colonial era, ancient Yoruba kingdoms such as the Oyo Empire had for many years suffered under several waves of jihadi attacks by the Islamic Sokoto Caliphate of the North, led by the famous Sultan Uthman Danfodio. Now, although the Igbos did not have a similar history of warring with the Hausa Fulani, 
the British colonial enterprise would create the perfect environment for the sharp differences between these two tribes to be brought to the forefront. In 1914, British High Commissioner Frederick Lugard effectively created the country we know today as Nigeria by bringing the northern and southern regions together in the now infamous Nigerian amalgamation of 1914. Till this very day, the feeling amongst many Yoruba and Igbo historians is that one of the main purposes of this amalgamation was to place the more affluent South under the control of the autocratic North. The theory goes that by joining the more educated and therefore less controllable Southern region to the much larger Northern region, the British government was better able to implement its policy of indirect rule as the amalgamation essentially gave dominion over the entire country to the Northern elites, who were significantly less rebellious and generally more amenable to British interests. It is also worth noting that from 1914 onwards, the British adopted a practice of placing Northerners in key leadership positions within the colonial administration. Despite being generally better educated, Southerners were more often than not limited to managerial and executive roles within the colonial apparatus. In the year 1969, the two-year Nigeria Biafra War killed an estimated one to three million people, mostly from the Igbo tribe in eastern parts of the country. What's worse, the starvation and the lack of support they were left with afterwards, the Igbo Bantus diaspora. Afterwards, over 10 million people died of starvation, mostly children. And so during that tele televised war, that's where you would see all these images of starving children in Africa, and then they would capitalize off of the charity for that. That's another. And this was... Uh, conflict between, again, the Fulani versus the Igbo. This is part of the ongoing conflict between Esau and Jacob, between the Fulani and the Igbos in Africa. How do they maintain slavery today? Well, they do it in a number of ways. It's as though this were an homage from France and Paris and Fashion Week to the Fulani who enable them to remain billionaires who monopolize all of the money in Africa, places like Nigeria. America does it too, but France is the most powerful colonizer in Africa. That's why when you go to France, you have no idea what these people do because they don't do anything. If you see, you know, the Nigerian leader, Buhari, taking trips off to England, he's going to visit his relatives. He's going to visit his cousins, the Rothschilds, because he is Fulani. And he is an Edomite who is, and this is what I always say to Africans, I'm like, you need to look into who the families are who are running your nation because this is not black on black violence. This is the Edomites against Israel. The Fulani and other Edomite tribes go all over West Africa and even to South Africa, taking over a farmer's land by feeding their cattle. And it causes desertification because the cattle twist and pull the grass up by the roots and so it compromises farms and the land and farmers and then the farmers wind up losing money losing their whole family their family gets split up and their children end up wandering the streets because the islamic government does nothing to protect the farmers counter this propaganda from the daily mail shows them as the most endangered people and this oppressed people However, they're participating in all of this capitalization of the land as sort of a quiet part of it. We have articles um, that state that most of the Muslims, as I said before in this, in, as I've been talking here, it says that most of these Muslims are Fulani. Now, amidst the Fulani are, of course, Hebrews and Ishmaelites who have mixed in with them and whose nations are somewhat integrated with them, although they do keep a degree of separation. But there is a problem with children of these other nations just wandering the street because they have no economic means of survival. And so there's all these young Almajiri children or Almajiri boys wandering the street, descendants of Ishmael and Israel. And it's quite an issue uh, in the land. The Amalgeri children are children who wander the streets begging for food under the guise of being potential 
Islamic students under some imam, and the imams usually exploit them. The Almajari grows up in the streets without love, care, or guidance of parents. His, his struggle for survival exposes him to abuse, homosexuality, and pedophilia, used as a slave and brainwashed, and recruited for antisocial activities and used for destructive and violent activities. This is the picture of the painful plight of the Almajari boys. And they say that they could be sitting on a ticking time bomb that could be worse than the endemic terrorism Boko Haram currently inflicts on them, so implying that these children can be made into child soldiers. They are abused and they're trafficked and they're molested. And the government doesn't really do anything about it because it's just kind of a free-for-all. Uh, the culture is a pedophilic culture. Now, I'm not saying that all Arabic culture is, but to a large extent it is. We've seen in Beast of No Nation um, that that's true. And so this is another way that the Israelites are still being enslaved and trafficked by the Muslims, by the Edomite Fulani. And these are the same people who trafficked Israel in the transatlantic slave trade from Africa over to America. All the officials seem to say is, oh, change is very slow. We're doing what we can. They've been saying that for years. This particular news story speaks of Islamic State of West Africa releasing a video of a child who looked to be around 10 years old executing a Christian man in Borno, Nigeria. And there's even a history of many of them being jailed for months and even years without any hearing, any court proceedings on the grounds that they are this potential military threat. When we look at the history of this, the Nigerian army had imprisoned a lot of child suspects, um, suspecting that they could possibly be used by Boko Haram as military agents, terrorists, child bombers, that sort of thing. And this became of great concern to Human Rights Watch. And so consequently, the children were released three weeks after Human Rights Watch published a report documenting the degrading inhuman conditions in which children have been held at Giwa Barracks. Human Rights Watch found that the children were detained without charge for months or years in squalid and severely overcrowded cells. Children described beatings, overwhelming heat, and frequent hunger. And remember, this is a pedophile culture, and it's Babylonian. That is part of this culture. Edom wears the red crown, and he is the predatory bird. And you'll notice Idris Elba is playing Edom in a lot of movies. Slavery continues all over the continent of Africa in Libya, Morocco, Yemen. A lot of people are trafficked and we're even going to touch on the Lord's Liberation Army, etc. Because once again, it's the same people, the Edomites. Said these men tried to bribe the Nigerian government, but obviously this kind of thing has been going on for a very long time. This is being used as leverage against the Chinese for Nigeria to get their country back. However, let's take a look at the real process that's been happening with the corrupt government. You know that the loan that China is paying, they cargoed it, meaning ship arrived with the money in containers. Why do you do that? Only in Nigeria, only in Nigeria, that they say a loan that was collected by the federal government had to come in a ship. Had to come in a ship. Okay. Do you know that the loan from IMF was what the, the, this Hausa people? I told you they have the all they think of is to chop money and to kill, just like an alligator. How can you come down to the level of corruption that you say loan in these days of digital digital banking, in these days of electronic banking, in these days of banking in which it's just wireless? They insist, say, make that money come in cash, land for Lagos Wharf. And so you're surprised when I say that they they follow they that is impunity. Remember the title of my show today is terrorism, loans, and impunity. They 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 say that is they no fear people anymore. Make it arrive in container where we feel collect our share. Do you know how much of that money gets lost in the process? 
loan money. How can you have a country? There's no that Nigeria. Ah, the worst thing in history. Money coming in container. I, when I heard it, my spirit left me. I called someone. I said, it's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. Jesus, it's a lie. It's, they confirmed it for me. They said, yes. That day, but army fool the wolf. That day, military presence in the wolf was beyond understanding because the money was arriving in a ship. The money was arriving in a ship. Military presence, full wolf on different loads that are arriving at the wharf, not through uh, uh, wireless, this thing all, come a part of Biafra for one reason, and that is to save the world from terrorism. Because the Fulanis are all thinking of how they could make the whole of Nigeria Sharia land. The pressure is the whole of northern Nigeria is Sharia, the whole of southern is Christian. If you've read the Quran, you will understand that this is an abnormality in their eyes. They are not supposed to be under us. The Quran forbids it that they should be under us. Like uh, uh, Muslim be vice president, Christian be president. It forbids that. It forbids that they should ever even work with us because we are unbelievers, we are infidels. Foreign banks have have eaten trillions of dollars from African money. Not the actual African just using it to do their investments, using it to trade on it. Because wait, like I told you the story. The other day that Trump, Trump released the name of all the Nigerian guys that have their money. is in billion, billion. In American banks. It's in billion, billion. And I remember how I told you how the trade world works. Million dollar deposits gives you permission to do million dollar trades. Billion dollar deposits give you permission to do billion dollar trades. So when someone puts in that kind of money, then he ignores it for eight years because he doesn't want EFCC to catch him. And he leaves it there till people forget he even stole it. Then he can go and touch it. Do you know how much money foreigners have made from that your money? And they trade daily. They don't trade in years. They trade daily. They've made trillions of dollars. Next, we're going to go into some of the Ethiopians. And as I said before, some of the 10 tribes remained among the Ethiopians. And as well as the descendants of Abraham and Keturah. So I already mentioned that Dan and Manasseh, so children of the half tribe of Manasseh, dwelt in the land. So some of the tribes, Adali is one of the tribes among the Eritreans. Okay. In Djibouti and Eritrea. This is where the Afar tribe lives. And they are descendants of Manasseh. And some of them are descendants of, this is Judah. And so some of them are descendants of Judah as well, as well as the sons of Midian. All right, and then there's the Oromo tribe, and these are more descendants of Esau. So Anok, Anok is one of them. And Dan is also the Danakil. The Danites are also among Danak, Dan brother. All right, are also the Afar, also known as the Dan Akil, are part of these Ethiopian tribes. And we read that in the last Prester John video. Go ahead and take a look at it. Right, we already went over this. All right, so the Solomonic dynasty, known as the House of Solomon, was a dynasty of the Ethiopian Empire formed in the 13th century. Its members claim descent from King Solomon and that the queen gave birth to Menelik after her biblically described visit to Solomon in Jerusalem. Now the Zagwe dynasty is, a, is the dynasty we were just talking about, okay? And those are descendants of Sheba as well as there's Dan mixed in and Manasseh's mixed in. And also there are members of the Midianites, descendants of Abraham and Keturah mixed in. And so this is a mixed nation of, of the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But this Zagwe dynasty was overthrown by Yakuno Amlek. So this is Amalek. All right. And that's who, who claimed descendancy from Solomon. And, um, and that um, dynasty 
was Haile Selassie. That's the second Edomite dynasty. And I know people don't like to hear that, but that's what it is. All right. And he does really look like an Edomite. And so here's another one of the um, Amalehu, another one of what I believe are the true Hebrews among the Eritreans. He looks very Eritrean, not Edomitish at all. And this is his son, his offspring. And he uh, actually went to war with the British. The British didn't support him at all. And they actually, when he got upset about it, they attacked him and killed him. And they took his son captive. And then his son, this guardian was set over him. And you can see he's clearly a Hun. He's a Gentile. All right, so we're going to move on now to China. And so we're going to make these connections, obviously, back to the Hun and the Gentiles who were Mongoloid race, because they did take over, as I said before, in the other videos on Prester John, they usurped the Ethiopians and they started to take the kingdom. So like I said, the Roman kingdom was divided into 10 tribes, 10 tribes, all right, around between 190 AD and 476 AD. The Rome, Romans were removed by the Goths, okay? And this was, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and exceedingly strong, and its teeth were of iron, devouring and crushing to atoms, and it trampled the remainder of its feet. And it was all together different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So this is the emergence of the ten horns, all right? And this comes from Tartaria and from the Mongoloids, who then morph into the Hebrew nations, all right, and take over the identity. So, Dan, and as I've said before, this is when there is all this mixing that goes on, but it's actually at the command of Yah. So if you look at, I've quoted this before, and this is from the Septuagint, Jeremiah 31, 27 to 32, and behold, the days will come, saith Yahuwah, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Yehuda with the seed of man and the seed of beast, because they are the seed of Satan, which who is the beast. And But then Daniel says, and whereas thou saw iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So this, I believe, is about transhumanism more so, and all their weird genetic mutations, but also there's something to be said because Yah does say, every seed that I have not planted will be uprooted. It has to be of his direction. And so these are all the groups, the fallen angel groups, the Suevi, the Visigoths, the Scythians, the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, the Saxons, the Lombards, the Franks, the Alemanni, the Burgundians, they become the German, Swiss, French, Italians, Portuguese, people of the Netherlands, um, they go into all the lands of Shem and take over their identities. And these are the Shiite dynasties of Asia. And see, this is what Menelik, all right, the, the line of Menelik became when mixed in with the Huns, so mixed in with the Chinese, Asian, Mongoloids, all right? We talked about this in the last Prester John video. And this was the last Menelik, all right? He's old here, so he's looking kind of faded out. But um, that's his descendancy among the, Mo the Mongoloids. He was all, this was also a Menelik, Prester John. And this kingdom most probably identifies as the medieval Russia or the horde known as the Great Mongolian Empire, according to medieval tradition. Prester John belonged to a very old genus and was really a descendant of the Magi, right? So that's the Assyrians, that is the Shemites, the Medo-Persians, or the Persians, I guess. And it is possible that the tribes of his subjects were the same as the infidel Turks of Benjamin of Toluja. All right, and so this is what, they call themselves Tuedros. Like even today, the Ethiopian head of the WHO calls himself, his last name's Tuedros two doors, right? So they took on this identity confusion by mixing. All right, and so this was the switch in this Prester John, the legend and its sources. Genghis Khan was serving 
one of the descendants of Prester John, and he worked very hard serving him as a vassal, and their nation paid tribute. And this is after the King Yelu. There was a King Yelu first who conquered all the land, and he conquered all the Arabs. And then up came the Hun, and the Hun paid tribute to him. Yelu Dashi, or Yelu Tashi, had defeated all of the Islamists in the area of Tartaria all the way to Ethiopia. And he had a great empire and the Arabs really respected him even in their defeat. He gave birth to a son who was the next Prester and this Prester gets into it with the Huns. The Russians originally, a lot of them were black. They were black Russians, okay? And very likely the original Russians were probably a little browner, right? Because this was not the fallen angel seed. But nonetheless, Esau went up in there. And we know that they are associated with Rusadan, the Sudonians, all right? And so that can be the Sudanese and the Sudonians. And the Sudonians oppressed the 10 tribes. Soon the Sudonians were oppressing the Israelites in the promised land. Sidon or Sadia, probably meant fishery or fishing town, etc. All right, and there was a queen of Georgia known as Rusadon, tied to the Sidonians or the Sadia. So in the Sudan and with the scattering of Israel, there coalesced these groups of people. And my this is my theory in that Amongst them were the Yahudin, so they would call them the Sudanese, right? And then there were the Hamites and Ishmaelites in that area as well, who pushed Israel out. And so it's a combination of, uh, it's really a mixed multitude, but a very dark one that is in the Sudan. And of course, Israel is caught in the mix there as the Yahudin. Darfur and the Sudan are areas that, you know, politically China kind of remains silent on as well as Russia. The Darfur genocide refers to current mass slaughter and rape of Darfur men, women and children in western Sudan. And the killings began in 2003 as the first genocide of the 21st century. It's carried out by a group of government armed funded Arab militias known as the Janjaweed which loosely translates as devils on horseback. Now, I don't know a lot about this. I've seen some documentaries on it. I'm no, by no means an expert on this, but the word was always that the weapons were coming from the Russians and the financing from the Chinese, and a lot of ivory was taken out of these areas and taken to China. So the Sudan is the largest country in Africa. You can see by this map here and see it's right next door to Israel. And um, <clears throat> one of the figures moving around there whose influence seems to have died down is um, Joseph Coney of the Lord's Resistance Army, who's been practicing um, in more of the southern region a lot of violence against men and women and children and setting up these armies of children and sending them through this extreme trauma and child sex slavery and forcing children to participate in hostilities was something that uh, Coney was known to have practiced. And now the word is that he's no longer really a threat. He's kind of died down. So, but they now say that they, this man is no longer a threat. Following independence from Britain in 1956, the Sudan became embroiled in two prolonged civil wars. For the remainder of the 20th century, conflicts were rooted in northern economic, political, and social domination of largely non-Muslim, non-Arab, southern Sudanese. So these people are Christians. And the civil war ended in 1972, but broke out again in 83. There were more than 2 million deaths over a two decades as the civil war between north and south reached its peak in the 1990s. The government ignored the reports of rising violence in Darfur. While the comprehensive peace agreement ended in the North-South War in 2005, granting additional political power to South Sudan, it failed to take into account the effects of the war on Darfur. Darfur remained 
underdeveloped and marginalized at the federal level, lacking infrastructure and development assistance. This neglect combined with allegations that the government was arming Arab tribesmen to raid non-Arab villages was cited as a justification for a February 2003 rebel attack on a Sudanese Air Force base in El Fasher, North Darfur. Today is the current situation between the Sudanese Catholics and the Pope. As you guys know, I love to show this video because there is a whole power switch black, back to black going on and uh, the Pope did remove the title Vicar of Christ from himself. Some people think it's because the Antichrist is here, but there's other reasons. The whole power structure is shifting to the West. These are uh, a number of Sudanese people in North western Africa or northeast, northeastern however you want to say because you know where everyone's confused about directions but this is part of that story so I just thought I would show these people so that wraps up the Muslims okay so thank you so much for watching Baruch Atah. Shalom please like subscribe and share like subscribe and share I encourage you to make a donation at livelightwell.com into all truth.net and in order to obtain a calendar, the Moed Appointed Times and Chaya Eat Life and Fast, they enable us to live our lives Hebraically, to line up with the appointments or meetings with our Creator who pours a message and a word into us and guides us into all truth. And it's by using these types of tools that we can remain faithful to our Elohim's word and enter into the promise, okay? So it's, it's not just a cookbook, uh, Chai Eat Life and Fast. It's about a Hebraic lifestyle, fasting, and the divine procession of life and order, and the Hebraic foods and healing, okay, from a Hebraic perspective. And so it helps you to line up with Yah's commands. Yasharel, return, O Yah, to the countless thousands of Israel. Yisrael. We love, worship, and praise Yahweh. Give him thanks by saying hallelujah.